Well, I'm headed down the Thornton River Trail, down towards the Thornton River. Um, about a half a mile into the hike, and so far this has been pretty easy hiking. It's just a steady uh, downhill hike. Nice, nice uh, trail to hike on. Uh, if you've watched any of my other videos, you know that those green and pink flowers laying on the trail come off of uh, tulip poplar trees. And that's the reason I stopped here to take this little video. If you look right over there, that's a pretty good sized tulip poplar right there. I put my trekking pole against it for scale. I'm still on Thornton River Trail. I'm about nine tenths of a mile into, into the hike now. And this area here, the elevation here is about 2,000 feet. The, ele uh, the, the terrain here is fairly flat uh, for being on the side of a mountain. Just a, just a real gentle slope. And I'm thinking this area once was cleared off for farming because if you look there, there's a big pile of rocks. So I'm thinking as people cleared off this to make a field, that's where they piled up the rocks. Those rocks didn't pile themselves up there. Somebody did that. So there's some evidence of this being an occupied area before the park was formed. I'm about 1.1 miles into my hike now. The elevation here is about 1,800 feet. And uh, if you look over here, here's more evidence that people live down here. Look at that. An old abandoned car. Might be a Model A, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, it's just a frame and the, the body looks like uh, I don't see uh, any of the drivetrain or the wheels or anything. I guess they got stripped off of it. But uh, there's more evidence that people live down here in an old abandoned car. I'm 1.3 miles into the hike now. The elevation here is uh, 1760. And this is one of several feeder streams that forms the beginning of the Thornton River. So here's the headwaters of the Thornton River. Here's some stacked stone fencing along the uh, along the trail. It goes on for a ways. There's some over here on this side too.
I'm 1.5 miles into the hike now. The elevation here is about 1,700 feet, and here's what the headwaters looks like now. I'm 1.9 miles into the hike now. The elevation here is 1,600 feet. And uh, here's what the headwaters look like now. I'm 2.3 miles into the hike now. The elevation here is about 1,400 feet. And here's what the Thornton River looks like here. I'm going to cross the river on those rocks and keep going that way until we get to the camp uh, areas, which are close by now. I'm 2.7 miles into my hike. The elevation here is 1340. Over there is the Thornton River. There's the trail heading downstream. And this may not look like it on this video, but this is a nice flat, relatively open area. That I had marked as potential camping spots. And when I look over there, that area back in there has been cleared out as a camping spot. So we'll go back in there and check that out. Here's one of the two areas I had marked as a potential camping spot. You can see it's nice and cleared out. And it's maybe, oh, I don't know, 50 yards from the Thornton River. The Thornton River is over there. So I'm going to get a couple more pictures of this uh, camping spot here and then we'll go down and check out the river. Here's what the Thornton River looks like next to that first campsite. This is the second uh, area I had marked 
as a potential camping spot. The last time I was down here was probably three or four years ago. This area was a little less cluttered then. You can see there's been, been a bunch of trees blown down and stuff. But uh, with a little bit of work you could drag some of that out of there and, and clear it up some. It's a couple of hundred feet away from the first campsite. And over there is the Thornton River, about 50 yards that way. So between these two, I like the first one better. I'm going to hike down to a, a crossroads about two tenths of a mile from here. That's my turnaround point for the hike, and then I'm going to come back up here and uh, set up for lunch at that first campsite. But here's the second one. This is the turnaround point for the hike. There's a crossing with a trail called Hull School Trail, H-U-L-L. And I've passed quite a few hikers, and look what they did. They put some arrows to show people which way to go. Isn't that clever? I guess the last people down are supposed to pick them up. Okay, I'm back at the first campsite. The one that I liked, and... Uh, I brought a little hammock with me, a day hammock. It's just a simple gathered end hammock with no bug net. So it wouldn't be very good for an overnight sleep, but it packs down real small and it's lightweight, so it's good for day hikes. So I'm going to see if I can hang my uh, hammock in between these two trees here. They're a little bit far apart, I think. But I'm going to give it a try. If it's too far apart there, I'll uh, pick a different pair to hang from. Okay, well there's my ENO double nest day hammock set up in between those two trees. They're kind of far apart, so there's a big curve there, but it fits okay. I moved a couple of rocks out from underneath me just in case something was to break I wouldn't want to fall on top of uh, rocks. Here's a little bit of a video showing how I attach the hammock to the trees. For overnight hammock camping, I use uh, wider straps than that. But for uh, just hanging up for a short period of time during the day like this, I just use this as 1800 pound rated mule tape, which is a type of a tape they use for pulling uh, cables through conduits. So one end of it up there, I've I tied a, uh, a knot, a loop, on one end of it. So it goes around the tree, through the loop. And then it comes down here, right here. For those of you that are familiar with knots, that's a marlin spike hitch on that end, which isn't really a knot I don't think, but uh, you put a loop in there and put the carabiner through it and that locks it into position. And then this is a uh, whoopee sling made out of a synthetic fiber called Amps Steel Blue. And there's the gathered end of the hammock. Amsteel Blue is a hollow woven line, and so if you look here, 
you'll see there's a section of the whoopee sling that goes into the center of the other section. So in through this section, you've got one part of the rope inside the other part, and that forms a constrictor section. So under load, the outer strands constrict on the inner strands and locks it into position without needing any knots. And then to adjust it, you either loosen the constriction from, from this end, you can loosen the constriction from this end to make it longer, or you can push on the constriction and pull on that on this loose end, that'll make it uh, shorter. So, uh, whoopee slings, the latest craze in hang hanging hammocks. Today's exciting lunch menu features water, bumblebee tuna salad in a can with crackers ready to eat. They even supply a little plastic spoon so you can scoop out the uh, tuna salad and put it on the crackers. A Nature Valley sweet and salty nut dark chocolate peanut and almond bar and the always popular Keebler cheese and peanut butter crackers. Too bad today's special isn't Memphis Soul Stew. Mmm, that would be good. Alrighty, here's a view from the hammock. I ate my lunch, took my hiking boots off, and I'm just relaxing a little bit. Sorry about the dirt on those socks, but that's what happens when you hike. You get crud in your, in your boots. I actually have a pair of gaiters that I bought. I put them in a drawer somewhere and forgot all about them. I guess one of these days I should get them out and use them. Most of the time I just get dirty socks like that. So here's the hammock. It's uh, got plenty of fabric. You could probably fit two people in here, actually. Oh man, that feels good. Here's a uh, view from the hammock. Looking towards the Thornton River. Maybe you can hear it in the background. Uh, so on an overnighter, I'd have a different hammock. I'd have a hammock with a with a bug net built in. You'd unzip it to get in, and I'd also have a, uh, a tarp strung across over the top of it in case it rained. And I'd be using wider straps than that. There's a little look over there. That's looking towards the other campsite, which you can't quite see from here. It's just a couple hundred feet that way. And right there's a rock where I have my what's left of my water. My hiking boots are sitting there. I don't see any illegal fires that were set in this place, so all is well here. Except for one thing. I don't like the looks of the sky up there. I know they're calling for rain later today, but I'm, I'm hoping I can get out of here before, before the rains come, because hiking in the rain is, is no fun. But anyway, here's one reason you might want to think about taking a, a hammock along with you on day hikes. You can just kind of throw them up somewhere and relax like this. This ENO double nest hammock has so much fabric that you could just about cover yourself up with it. Look. 
put some Velcro tabs on there every so often and you could help keep yourself warm. I really think the single nest hammock would be more than enough for day hiking, but you know me, I had to get the double nest. Now I got all this extra fabric to, to fool around with when I get in there, but it's nice. Another view from the hammock looking towards the Thornton River. I dropped half my trail bar on the ground down there, but I invoked the five second rule which states clearly that as long as it's not on the ground more than five seconds, it's still safe to eat. So I picked it up and ate the rest of it. So far so good. I'm still living. Thought I'd show an example of uh, the maps that I use while I'm hiking. Um, I like these. These I download for free off the uh, US Geological Survey website. They have a website where you can download these maps. This one is the quadrangle name is Thornton Gap and this one's dated 1994. I like these older maps because there's more information on them than the new maps, believe it or not. Now this is just one uh, piece of a map that I zoomed in on and then d did sort of like a print screen. The uh, red line here is Skyline Drive. This X here is where we're currently located. And the bright yellow shows the trail. I started up here and hiked my way down and we're right here at the X right now and we're going to turn around and hike back up. There's a couple of important pieces of information that you need to copy uh, from, from, from the master map onto the, the piece that you're using. When you're using a GPS uh, you have to know the data reference system that they used for the map this one is North American Datum 1927. That's the reference model that was used when they created this map. These numbers up here, 33, 34, 35, 36, and these numbers here, 87, 88, 89, those are UTM coordinates in thousands of meters. So each one of these squares is one kilometer wide and one kilometer high. So I set my GPS on UTM and I put the data reference model in the GPS to NAD27 and then the coordinates I get on my GPS will match this map. Now you can do a lot of navigating without a GPS by using a compass. Another piece of information that you need to copy off the uh, map is the uh, magnetic declination. I drew it down here. These vertical lines, these UTM lines that are vertical, they're not true north. They're called grid north. And there is a diagram at the bottom of these maps that tells how many degrees of variation there is between the grid north and the magnetic north. On this map there's 12 degrees western declination which means that a compass points 12 degrees to the west of these vertical lines in this in this part of the country. So this is also showing a correctly oriented map. What I did was I dialed in using the bezel on my compass, I dialed in 12 degrees of western declination. And then you put your compass on the map so that the edge of the compass is on one of those lines. And then without moving the compass you turn the map 
and the compass together until the needle goes into the red. Just like that. And now you have a correctly oriented map. Here's a look at a few things I carry with me, even on day hikes. Um, this is a safety whistle. I have it attached to this D-ring with a piece of uh, thread so that I can, uh, if I pull on it hard, that thread will break, but it'll still be attached with the lanyard. So I got safety whistle. This is a bear bell. There's a magnet on the bottom of it right here that keeps it from making noise if you pull this mesh off, the magnet comes off with it and then the bear bell will make noise. I, I use that uh, sometimes when I'm hiking so uh, the bears can hear me coming. That's my Garmin E-Trex 30 hiking GPS. I love that thing. That thing's great. Highly recommend that. Um, over here is a thermometer with a compass that I got from REI for seven or eight dollars. I use the thermometer part, I don't use that compass. This little thing here is uh, called the, uh, this little thing here is called the stick pick. And it's, it's used to, uh, you attach your camera, it attaches to your camera up here, and there's a jam nut that jams it in tight. And then this part you put into your trekking pole and you can have your camera look back at you and you can take pictures of yourself uh, or other things like that. There's a couple other things. On the back of my pack I've got some, some more uh, carabiners like this. These are just general purpose carabiners. These are not climbing rated ones. Um, those blue ones that you saw in my hammock, those are real climbing rated carabiners. Well, look what we have here. Thirty-eight Special Smith and Wesson Airweight Five Shot. Just in case. Another big tree bites the dust. Hiking in the rain. Well, here I am back up on Skyline Drive. I had to hike about a half an hour in my rain gear because it started raining pretty hard for a while and of course as soon as I get up here 
it stopped raining. That concrete post over there is the trailhead for the Thornton River Trail. And uh, here's the parking lot. I'm sitting on the uh, rear gate of my car trying to dry off a little bit before I get in my car. That's Skyline Drive there. So I'm going to sit here for a few minutes and try and dry out a little bit. And then I'm heading back down the side of the mountain at Thornton Gap down US 211 to Sperryville where they have Burgers and Things my favorite little stopping off point. They also have chocolate milkshakes. This is Thornton Gap, one of the uh, gaps in the mountains that you can use to uh, get entry into the Shenandoah National Park. U.S. Route 211 crosses over the mountain here. That's the uh, rest area, it's called Panorama. And uh, anytime you come in this section of the park, I like to stop there and use the bathrooms coming in and then usually leaving also. Up there, hidden behind those trees, is a peak called Mary's Rock. That's a real popular hiking spot. Down here, let's see if I can turn around without falling off this wall. Down here is what's left of a parking lot. And there used to be a building there, a restaurant, and so forth called Panorama. It's long gone now. The only thing left is the parking lot here and this this road that winds itself around. I guess it went down below the... Uh, it goes down and, and hooks up with the US 211. US 211 is right down there through those trees. You can probably hear the traffic. And up there is one of the um, mountains uh, looking to the north in Shenandoah Park. That might be Pass Mountain. Turn around here without falling off again. And back to the uh, restrooms. I'm standing on Skyline Drive where it crosses US 211 here at Thornton Gap. There's uh, US 211 coming up the side of the mountain from Sperryville. And there's the entrance to Shenandoah National Park right there. That's Skyline Drive headed northbound. And off in the distance, I don't know if you can barely see them, but there's a mountain range down over there, the Massanutten Mountain Range way off in the distance. That turn off there goes to the Panorama Comfort Station. And way up there is the peak known as Mary's Rock. I'm heading back down the side of the mountain towards Sperryville on US 211. And I turned on the video because this is one of the, the few times I've ever followed motorcycles that they were actually going slow. Most of the time they race up and down this mountain as fast as they can. And there's a lot of warning signs about motorcycle crashes and stuff. But I think the reason these two are being pretty careful is it just stopped raining and the road's still wet. 
So uh, I think they are being extra careful they don't go skidding off the side of the mountain and down a couple thousand feet into a canyon. We haven't actually gotten up to the next hairpin turn, but even these turns are fairly tight. <clears throat> So these, these two right here, I'm going to give them the good, good motorcycle driving award for the week. Okay, here's a tight hairpin turn right here. Let's see what, what happens here before I turn off the video. Okay, very nice. That was done at 25 miles an hour, just like you're supposed to. Burgers and things. My favorite place to stop eat and eat. It's on US 211 at Sperryville. There's 211 coming down off the side of the mountain. You can't miss this place.